Good morning. Hello. Good morning, Hello. everyone. It must be. It feels like lunchtime, Tracy. It, it, it is feels... lunchtime, actually. My tummy's rumbling, but um, more important things to do. We, we're going to have a, a chat over lunch, and we've got James Mayhew. James Mayhew's with us. Hi, Hello. James. Hello. Hi, Tracy. It's lovely to see you. Thank you for joining us. Um, now we um, we have met before, haven't we? Yes, um, three or four years ago, I think now probably. Yeah, I came in and did a, a storytelling in the shop. You, you did, and it was a bit more than a storytelling, wasn't it? Because while you told your story, you produced this. Oh, you still have it. Oh my goodness. Oh, we still have it. it has of course place. we do. <laughs> it's framed and it has pride of place and we love it. And we tell people proudly that it was made by James Mayhew. Um, but you, you work with lots of people who are a, a bit... Um, bigger names than us don't don't you do you want to tell us about your work um i don't know where to start really um so that, that's a very good point actually you're quite diverse <laughs> um well I'm, I'm an author and illustrator so i trained as an illustrator originally and illustrate um books for other writers as well so i do a whole mixture of stuff for books we also do other things like um uh, work in in schools um, and as a storyteller and uh, I used to teach in Cambridge at the art school, although now I've moved to Suffolk, I don't do that anymore. It's a little bit too far. And I also work with musicians and orchestras and tell the stories behind classical music and paint illustrations live on stage during the performances. So lots of strings to the bow, I think you could say. Mm. That's, that's quite a skill that I, we were admiring when you were telling the story at the same time as doing the painting mm. here. Um, upside down with the canvas in your lap. Um, it, it was brilliant, actually. Um, so you also work with the National Gallery? Yes, I have done on many occasions, um, both in London and the National Galleries of Scotland and Edinburgh, mm. um, obviously because of the Katie books, telling stories about famous paintings, as demonstrated by my glamorous assistant there. So, um, yes, I've, I've often been invited into the galleries to do um, mm various workshops and projects, sometimes celebrations around anniversaries of the books or, or, or linked or themed around a particular exhibition. So it's really nice to be part of that world occasionally as well. Because the, the Katie's Picture Show, which um, displayed, is the first of quite a long series, isn't it? It is, yes. That was my very first book, published 31 years ago originally 1989 and uh, yeah I never dreamed it would be a whole series it was it was a story I came up with when I was at art school and I didn't even know I'd get it published it was just a, a college project and when I showed it to a publisher Orchard Books they they loved it and wanted to publish it and and it's rolled into a whole series which even now, all these years later, is still a bit of a surprise to me, really. It's a lovely thing to have done. Uh, there are 13 storybooks. There are some activity books as well. So, yeah. well, so I'm, I'm very familiar with them because I read them continuously to my children. But for anyone who's not familiar with them, do you want to just sort of explain what's going on? Mm, in the books? Absolutely. So, um, well, I'll, I'll grab a book. So, um, that's Katie's Picture Show, the first. And in the story, Katie goes to a gallery with her grandma and grandma falls asleep, leaving Katie to look around the gallery all by herself. And she sees, of course, lots of beautiful paintings, famous paintings, real paintings that you can visit in galleries and see in real life. And under the paintings is a sign that says, please do not touch. Now Katie's quite naughty and she does touch. <laughs> and discovers the paintings are real. You can go inside them and have magical adventures. So uh, each book has an adventure inside five different paintings. Usually they're linked by a artist or a, a school of art or by a particular theme. So um, they're, they're sort of educational, but very fun and free and I hope imaginative. And, and I, hope, I really hope children enjoy them and find their way into looking at paintings through them. 
Undoubtedly they do. I think I was, I mentioned to you, James, in, in brief when we were communicating to begin with that my seven year old has now got a, a homework assignment in which he's, they're told they have to explore a famous artist and he's taken this idea of jumping into a picture, which he's totally ripped off. And, um, <laughs> and is making a little video imagining he's an art critic going around. So it's, it's wonderful how it is a, it's a complete um, um, leaping, like, a, a, what's the expression? Um, a jumping off point, really, for, for children to be able to have the freedom to explore those amazing works of art in a medium that's really familiar to them, like the picture book. So it's, it's really engaging. We've had loads of good conversations about it. So, yeah. That's very, very kind. So wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Con. And I've learned a lot about how these artists painted in terms of their particular techniques and, and approaches to art. So it's been um, quite useful for me in some respects to, to learn those skills um, and, and, and learn about the history behind the paintings as well. So it's been great for me. And I do get letters from parents saying that their children are um, begging them to go to a gallery so it's, it's it's lovely actually to to, to know that i've done that um, i'm sorry tracy you are. so the katie books that's that's that was your first book that you got published with but you've gone on to do all sorts of other work haven't you yes yes many other things um katie's the biggest and longest series but there's also ella bella ballerina oh yes very popular <laughs> which uh which i think is six or seven books long and, um, and actually it's a mouse and mole. I mean, that's now six books and is growing and growing. I'm just about to start sixth, uh, hasn't been published yet, but uh, I've also got plans for the seventh and the eighth books in the series. Those stories are all by Joyce Dunbar, of course, who's, who's in Norwich and um, they're fabulous stories. I mean, it's an interesting history with those because they were first published around 20 years ago. And there was a lovely television series, uh, all beautifully done. But then the books fell out of print, as, as so often they do. And we've had to wait a long, long time, nearly 20 years, to get them back in print. At the time that Joyce wrote the original story, she wrote many, many, many others, which haven't seen the light of day until now. So it's really exciting. That she's opened the drawer and taken out all these stories from 20 years ago. And they are wonderful, wonderful stories. And I feel so lucky to be illustrating them because I love those characters. They're great. They're the, the stories and the characters fit like a glove, I think, with the way I just draw naturally. It's like my own handwriting drawing mouse and mole. It's very natural and instinctive. Brilliant. Well, I know that our customers have really enjoyed them. And more recently, um, we've had a lot of interest in this book, Gaspar the oh, Fox. Yes. yes, another local connection because Zeb and I both went to the same school in Lowestoft, um, many years apart. He's about 12 years younger than me. And he, of course, is, is the voice of um, the news and the shipping forecast on Radio 4. And he was visited in real life by a fox in Islington. And it, and it was injured and he, he tended to it and they became very close. The fox um, bonded very strongly with him. And so he started writing these stories and asked me to illustrate them. And I was thrilled to say yes. And they're quite different to anything I've done before because they are set very much in the real world. Most of my other books are uh, fantastical in one element or another. And although the animals can talk, they are quite um, quite quite realistic in the, in, the, in the sense of their behavior. So. Um, so yeah, it was, a, it was a different experience to have to see the real fox and see all the locations and, and draw much more from real life. Interesting. We've got a, a crime series we've been looking at where one of the characters is a badger. Um, so <laughs> so uh, it's happening in adults' books as well, but we'll hit all the wild population slowly but surely. Um, so that's, that's really, what are you working on now? You mentioned having a, a bit of a mess on the floor, I, I overheard. Oh, well, I've always got a mess on the floor. <laughs> uh, uh, this weekend I've been doing some painting to music for some, um, it's a musician's charity actually, because as, as you'll be aware, so many musicians have lost a lot of work this year and including many of the musicians that I'm used to working with when I um, paint with them on stage. So uh, they asked me to paint to some recordings they've made of Christmas carols and I'm not quite sure what platform they're going to be released on but they're going to do an, a sort of advent calendar of music starting tomorrow. Uh, it'll be all across social media and uh, the, the idea is to get people to, to watch, pay a little money 
and, and help all these musicians who've lost their livelihoods. So I've been painting to Christmas carols this weekend. But in book terms, um, I'm just about to start the next Mouse and Mole book, book six, um, which is going to be called The Secret of Happiness. Um, and yeah, I've done, I've done the rough sketches, so they've been approved. So tomorrow I'll be starting on the finished art for, for that Mouse and Mole book. Wonderful. I see you've got a massive selection of books there. Um, do you, because I'm in the bookshop, I have Never customers. Have um, do you want to, oh, well, do you have any books that you want to show to M? Any, anything that we might find interesting? Mm, yeah, please do, James. Ooh, yeah, there, there's a question. Well, there's loads and loads of books here. Actually, speaking of Zeb, he got me this beautiful book for my birthday, um, which is a very old book. Um, I, I love the stories from the Arabian Nights. And so he got me this uh, very antique edition, which is illustrated by one of my favorite illustrators, Edmund Dulac. Um, that's oh, wow. Regard. I mean, they are just gorgeous, 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 stunningly beautiful illustrations, all on little separate pieces of paper tipped into the book. Um, magical illustrations. I don't think anybody's illustrated the Arabian Nights better. So that, that was a, a really beautiful gift. I fell in love with these stories and this illustrator um, a long time ago when I was a child because there was an illustration I'm trying to find it and I probably won't it was on the cover of a record that my parents had the record was Scheherazade by Rimsky-Korsakov the music and uh, I fell in love with the music the story um, the idea of Scheherazade the composer Rimsky-Korsakov everything no I can't find it. it's in here somewhere and, um, and and I was very young but actually that was a, a very important encounter because it really led to me working with musicians and orchestras and painting to music. That love of music grew from that Edmund Dulac illustration on an LP sleeve, which is um, quite an unusual way into to classical music, perhaps. Um, but um, I, I love that book. That's something I really cherish. Um, I've got so many you a question, James, about that. So one thing that really interests me about your work is uh, the interconnectedness of working with storytelling, with art, with music, with that kind of live response to doing stuff. Um, on stage or, or as we found in the bookshop or in schools. What is the role of the storyteller? Because above all else, you tell stories, don't you? So what's the what's the balance, do you think, between the telling of the story and the the visual representation of that story or the audible representation of that story? Because it seems to me they're all very important. And the more they work together, the more amplified the importance or the the success of that story can you can you talk about that a little yeah i mean that's a huge question in a way I it's mean, a I huge question yes talk about it for hours probably but i think i think um the, the term storyteller is often narrowed down to the idea of somebody who is a professional storyteller but we're all mm. storytellers really we're all telling stories we're all you know whether we're gossiping about the neighbors or whatever everybody's telling stories all the time i think um storytelling is just a really important form of communication, but using established stories, folk tales, legends, myths, and that kind of storytelling. Um, it's something I really enjoy doing in schools and with groups of children or with adults, because I love the fact that when you're a storyteller, as opposed to the printed word, you can change nuance, you can change mm -hmm. vocabulary, you can even change ever so slightly what happens in the story, depending on your audience. And sometimes I'm in a school, and I'm faced with a, I don't know, a hall with, with 100 kids in, I think, okay, that part of the story isn't going to work with that lot. I can just tell. So you weave around that and you draw out other elements of the story, which are already there in the story, but you make more of the bits that you think they will be excited by. So I love that flexibility. Um, and I think in terms of how it relates to, to art and music, obviously I'm a visual person. I went to art college, I studied illustration. So having an image um, is something that just just feels right. I just what I want to create images to go with stories. And I suppose in, in terms of my practice of, of, of telling story, it makes me feel more secure. Um, I'm not exactly saying I hide behind the illustrating because I love language and I really enjoy telling stories and finding the right tone of voice and the, and the right um, expressions to use. But I, I love the fact that having a piece of art that grows gradually, slowly in time to the story, will hold their attention. If I was just telling a story, I'd like to think I would hold their attention, but I don't know. But if I'm doing an illustration, they they will 
be more concentrated. And I think also at the end, they then have a memory. They have this image. So they can then go off and, and remember the story and tell other people the story and the story lives better, longer in that way. And I think the same applies to music. So much music does tell stories. Of course, there's a lot of abstract music, maybe a, a symphony or something that doesn't have a program or a narrative, but lots of the great composers did write pieces of music based on narrative. I've already mentioned Scheherazade, which is perhaps one of the more obvious examples, but there are many, many things. I mean, all the ballet music is obviously narrative, but there are many other what we call tone poems or musical pictures, things like The Sorcerer's Apprentice, that kind of music, um, which vividly paints what's happening in the story, but in music, and it works better than a picture in some ways, because of course it, it moves through time as a story does, whereas an, an image, unless it's a sequence of images, that's static. Um, so I'm fascinated with combining all these things. So when I'm painting live, quite often the painting will evolve, quite often the painting to music will start as one image and then gradually, almost like an animation, it will merge into a different image. And I like that. I like the, I like the surprise on the face of the audience to see me completely rub something out before their eyes during a piece of music and then it, it grow into something new. That's, that's a kind of magic for me. So I, I like the idea of blending all these things as much as possible. I think if we're going to have music live, um, then have, have the art live as well. It just makes sense to me. And I try to underpin what's happening in the music. So it's all quite carefully choreographed. I don't want them to not listen to the music. I want the music to be enhanced by what's happening in the painting. So if there's a particular um, phrase in the music or uh, maybe a, a climax crash on the cymbals or something like that. You try to think of something you can paint to match that drama and the music. Um, it takes a long time and, and a lot of effort and a lot of thought, a lot of research into the stories um, and the versions that the composers were using and were inspired by, because I like to try and keep it authentic to the composer's intentions as far as I can. So it is a huge project, a lot of work. And sometimes these pieces are only ever performed once. Other pieces like, I don't know, um, Carnival, Carnival of the Animals or pictures at an exhibition I've painted to many times, but other works um, I've maybe painted to just once. And uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's a lot of work. So it's a, it's a labor of love. Mm. It's just, you know, the adage that, you know, the picture's worth a thousand words. I think you must be keenly aware of that being an illustrator. What, what other books have you got that illustrate that? that you've got, well, that you were about to show me and then I um, bombarded well, you with the question. <laughs> well, I mean, there's, there's so many here to choose from. I mean, uh, I mean, I'm fascinated with illustration. Brian Wildsmith. So he did this gorgeous animal gallery, which has been reissued now. And um, look at the, these incredible paintings. There are hardly any words. A stare of owls. So these are all um, the, the groupings of of animals, um, which we might not know about. A sloth of bears. See, I never knew that was the collective man for bears before. Um, and these, these are just, I mean, this is from the 60s, but it's still so beautiful. A leap of leopards. I'll just move that slowly along so you can just see how beautiful that art is. So I, I love collecting illustrated books. As you probably know, I post an illustration every day on social media, mm -hmm. book illustration of the day. So I'm always looking for um, really interesting, unusual, beautiful books. Um, this one by Morris Sendak, really not very well known. I mean, he's so famous for books like Where the Wild Things Are. And this is a collection of songs, um, which he has illustrated. And the illustrations are just gorgeous. I think some of his most lovely work is in this book. Look at that, isn't that just Oh, gorgeous. wow. It's just such a lovely, 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 lovely book to have. Um, else can I show you? I mean, I could bore you all day with <laughs> interesting books. Um, this is a lovely one, Cinderella. By an Italian artist, Benny Montresor. Um, very strange illustrations, all in bold colour, but I just really like them. I just really unusual. So I'm always attracted to something that's a little bit usual, a little bit different, that other people might not necessarily have seen. Um, trying to find it. This is my favourite book growing up as a kid and I bet you've never seen it. No. Um, because I don't think it was published here. My dad was in the Air Force and he 
traveled around a bit, and I think he brought this back from America. It's an American book. Long, 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 long out of print. It's called The Big Cleanup by Harvey Weiss. It's about a little boy sent to clean his room because it's full of mess, a bit like my studio. Look at that. And he's given two boxes, and he marks one to keep and one to throw away. And he goes through all the stuff, and every single thing he finds, like this stick, he realizes it's useful. I mean, it's very topical now. He imagines he can make a bow and arrow for monsters. He's going to make a railing for the veranda of the house he's going to build for his pet dog, Morris. Um, I mean, just quite bonkers things. He finds um, an old spark plug. He thinks, well, you never know. I might be in an aeroplane that's about to crash and I need a spark plug. So I'm going to keep the spark plug. It might come in handy one day. Um, one roller skate. What can you make with one roller skate? This is before um, skateboards have been invented. So he imagines one ski and one roller skate, which is all he has, um, and creating the first ever skateboard before they were invented. He finds um, a cotton spool and he's going to invent a wheelchair for his dog if he gets a splinter in his paw. And it's just absolutely magical. My favourite one of all is he finds a key and he imagines going on this rescue bid to find his dog Morris, who's trapped in a little dungeon and setting him free. So this book, The Big Cleanup, was absolutely my favourite book as a child. And it's frustrating that, you know, so many people, so many generations of kids have never seen that book. So I think it's an absolute delight. It is, it is troublesome. I, I came across a, a book recently that is about 30 years out of print. I think it was my husband's as a kid. And it was just absolutely charming. And it, it's a shame that there is sort of a, a life, which is, a, you know, a shortish life, which is why, you know, as, as your friend kindly bought you that beautiful Arabian Nights edition there, there is such joy, isn't there, in uh, rescuing some of these old books from places that we find them. There really mm. is. And that's one of the joys of doing this book illustration of the day. Um, yeah. These tweets, because almost every day somebody gets in touch and says, oh, I remember seeing that. I haven't seen that, seen that illustration for 50 years. And I love that book. And now I know what it's called. And I'm going to go and try and find a secondhand copy. And that, that's really magical when something like that happens. Mm. But I also try to post new illustrations as well. Particularly this year, a lot of people have been in touch and said, oh, I've got this book coming out and everyone's locked down. And and um, you know, can you give me a, a bit of support? So I'm always really happy to support beautiful new books that need a little bit of a lift. Um, so speaking of the newer books then, James, have you got any recommendations for, for books that we can actually purchase now without having to scour the shelves of a wonderful secondhand shop? <laughs> What's interesting you at the moment? There have been some beautiful books this year. I'm just gonna go back to my shelf again and look for, for some. I, I thought this was really charming, actually. This really made me chuckle. I love, oh, there we go. I love Alex T. Smith's work. He's so funny, such a funny guy. And I, I think he's a brilliant illustrator. I mean, just look at all the imagination and detail in this sort of thing. He's lovely. Oh, wow. so this is not the 12 days of Christmas that everybody knows and loves, exactly. It's a really clever, funny twist on it. So that, that's one I would highly recommend. Um, Shirley Hughes has written a sequel to, to Dog. The Dog is Oh, beautiful. yes. Which I, which I have got, but it's downstairs. Um, but that's a really, really lovely um, rounding off of something that's so legendary. And I just really admire her. You know, she's in her 90s and she's still producing books of a really high quality. And I think that's absolutely inspiring. I hope I'm still doing that when I'm her age. I think she's an amazing woman. Um, she's done so much for, for um, sort of rights of um, children's books, authors and illustrators as well. Um, trying to think of what else would be easy to find because I've got some quite unusual books here but um, this is a very poignant book which came out earlier this year The Little War Cat and oh. it's a very topical subject war and conflict and um, the trouble it causes of course but I thought this was a, a really tender touching story about um, now, based on a true story, I believe, of a man who rescued lots of cats um, in Syria, I think. Um, and then this cat observes this uh, very sad child who's obviously been very badly affected by war. And we don't know the details. We don't know what the boy has seen or what he's gone through. We just know that he's not happy. And the cat can see that he's not happy. And the cat empathises with him. And because the cat has been shown kindness by this older man, um, the cat shows kindness to the boy and helps him 
heal from his experiences. It's a very beautiful, very moving book with lovely lyrical, um, what I would call real illustrations in there very painterly, um, clearly done by hand, not digitally done. And I think that 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 sort of story really needs something with that sort of humanity and that tactile quality in them. I thought that that, that was a really beautiful book um, and one that moved me very much. I think you, you were holding up those ones as, as um, James was speaking there, Tracy. So we've got those copies of those in shop right now, which are they're absolutely beautiful. They are, they are. I would highly recommend all of them. I think they're very special books, those, those three in particular. Yeah. It's so exciting to hear um, illustrators and authors I haven't read yet. So this is part of the joy of speaking to people like um, like yourself is that, you know, it, it does open that door even further into the world of picture books or books generally. Mm, thank you for that. You're Tracy, awesome. you've been you've been having a busy morning in the shop. Do you want to dive in? <laughs> uh, I'm going to have to watch the playback to, to find out what I missed. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, the, even though we are still in lockdown, we are still having click and collect and um, customers waiting on the doorstep and the, the phone ringing. So sorry about that. Um, I, I found this really fascinating. And I, I love, um, as Em said, finding ab about other illustrators that we didn't know about. And I noticed that um, one of the books you held up, the one that was illustrated by the Italian the, with the red hardback, um, in those very bold colors, there's a lot of kind of retro publishing now to, to look like that. People are trying oh. to achieve that again. Um, and Absolutely. And I think, um, I mean, those books were produced lithographically um, in the 40s, 50s, early 60s. And that's quite a complicated process. And it meant that the illustrators in that, that period would have had to work really hard and plan the illustrations very, very carefully. So they were not just good illustrators, they had to be excellent graphic designers as well. Nowadays, it can all be done digitally. You can create those sort of layers of art that suggests lithography. And I think it's much easier to control. So a lot of people, a lot of artists, and I know from my experience of teaching at Cambridge, at the art school there that lots of uh, young illustrators are very influenced by by that whole um, retro look that sort of vintage style and, and it is very beautiful and I can understand why they why they would be um, and uh, it still looks very fresh and relevant now which I think is why a lot of people are looking towards that and um, yeah it's lovely to see those old books as you said before being rediscovered and remembered um, because there were some wonderful, wonderful artists. Sometimes I get the most beautiful books in my collection and the artists aren't even credited. It's, it's, it's astonishing. So it's lovely to be able to try and do some detective work, find out who they are and um, and celebrate their work. Your, the, the illustrations you post every day are really inspiring and it's mm -hmm. just a, a, a bright spot in the day to see those. So thank you for that. Well, the, you you are so diverse and so busy and you produce so much I, I think just to say thank you not just for your time today but for the gift of all your art and all of the work that you put into it making it work with the other um, forms of art as well is it's really something very special so we're very very grateful that you joined us today to talk about it it's been my pleasure to, to chat to you all and uh, lovely to, to see you and um, Good luck with, with um, the future and I hope you come out of lockdown and, and everybody comes back to the bookshops and the world comes back to normal very soon. Um, I hope take care so. And uh, happy Christmas. Happy yes, Christmas. I suppose we're allowed to say that now, aren't we? I think so, yeah. Yes, well, we all seem to be starting it a little bit earlier this year and why not? <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you, thank you again. Lovely to see My you. Pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, bye.